Lamb's book uh, that Timothy mentioned that got me involved in really starting to study climate change as a significant event and that he emphasized that cool periods were destructive to mankind and humanity and generally warm periods are beneficial to humanity. Our next, next speaker spoke at breakfast, Patrick Michaels, is a distinguished senior fellow at the School of Public Policy at George Mason and senior fellow of environmental policy at the Cato Institute. He's also past president of the American Association of State Climatologists. It's, uh, Pat also is now a columnist for Forbes magazine. I thought I'd put a punch in for his column. He is uh, the editor of the new book, which he discussed today, uh, Climate Coup, Global Warming Invasion of Our Government in Our Lives. It's also been rumored he has a sense of humor. <laughs> Pat will discuss the data record has been subverted by the political process and give illustrations of how hypotheses can be tested using scientific data. Well, I have, I have this slight problem, which was uh, at about 9.30 last night, I was informed that Senator Inhofe was not coming and could I please come and give the breakfast talk, uh, which meant that that probably would look an awful lot like my talk now. The reason I was uh, fiddling with my computer there, I was not being rude. Uh, now only 11 of the 32 images will be from this morning. It would have been a lot more before. Uh, so uh, this complicated title explains uh, the way that I view climate change. Uh, I think that, that there are really two uh, schools of, of thought on this, and, and one of them is dominated um, by what I called earlier the State Science Institute, which I will show you again because I really like the image so very much. Uh, we'll call them the hotheads. Uh, and then there are the people who say, well, there's a human influence on climate, as I will tell you that there is, uh, but it's not the end of the world. And I was, it was on, on Anthony Watts's blog, which is the world's greatest climate blog, I have to admit. Um, I, I learned that I had got, this had drawn a name, and I had a name, and I was called a lukewarmer. And I, I agree that that is precisely uh, my synthesis on this. And again, uh, this, this is number two of the, of the 11 slides that are the same. Uh, the, ba the background for this is, uh, was given in, in Eisenhower's farewell address. The operative sentence is uh, holding science and re scientific research in respect as we should. We must be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite, the prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment project allocations and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. As I said this morning, that um, gave rise to the overall climate coup that I talked about in my book. Now this slide has been slightly changed. If they had an athletic team, the State Science Institute would be the home of the hotheads uh, and, and for good reason. Uh, you understand that, that uh, there, the way that we got to the imbalance in the literature that we got to is that there is really no incentive structure built into the $103 billion of climate change money that has now been allocated total over the years. Uh, if a person sends in a paper that says, well, you know, this is probably not the end of the world, I guarantee you that the reviewers feel threatened and that they will give it the most difficult review possible. This is just human nature. It's not a conspiracy. These people go around saying, oh, you guys believe in a weird conspiracy. Absolutely not. And if you send in a paper that says this is the end of the world, <laughs> well, there is every incentive to have that paper published. It keeps the gravy train on the track, uh, and it goes on and on. This is nearly public choice. It is not a conspiracy at all. This is one of the other ones I talked about earlier. That's why I'm going through these so fast. Uh, we, we write papers now where the reviewers don't even demand numbers. Uh, this is a paper published in Nature magazine. Uh, our results show that global climate changes may have underestimated the observed trend in heavy precipitation events. It could have actually shown the numbers. Again, this is from this morning. Uh, this is the actual change in precipitation on the heaviest day of the year uh, in the United States. They could have cited this work down here. Um, we found that uh, the, the heaviest day of the year, the precipitation is now uh, one quarter of an inch higher than it was 100 years ago. This, is, this would make that result that you saw uh, here. Whoops, this is supposed to go backwards. 
Yes, this, this would be called the Journal of Nugatory Research because it's meaningless. Uh, anyway, and uh, I also talked about earlier today about taking one year's worth of data, a remarkable achievement, and just saying that one year's worth of data implied that global warming had all of a sudden doubled its rate. And this was actually published in geophysical research letters. Now you cannot, I don't think any science teacher could say that there is not some type of bias in the peer review process that would allow a paper to be published with complex mathematics, and et cetera, that would take this one warm period and say that somehow things had changed and that the warming rate would now double from 0.17 to 0.3 degrees per decade, when in reality it went to statistically zero uh, a year and a half before the paper actually went into print. Fine. Uh, the, and then there's the issue with credibility. And now I'm going to begin to diverge from what I did this morning. But it's important to understand that the hothead point of view is that, that there is an instability in the Greenland ice sheet and that if the integrated warming is about uh, 2 to 3 degrees Celsius for 100 years, that all the ice will fall off the thing and sea level will go up 6 meters pronto yesterday. Now, this ignores what is in the scientific literature, and I did not quote from that this morning, so I now will. Uh, this is from the Geological Survey of Norway. Uh, recent mapping of a number of raised beach ridges in the north coast of Greenland suggest, you, don't, you don't get beaches, you know, with a lot of ice on the ocean, suggests that the ice cover in the Arctic Ocean was greatly reduced some six to 7,000 years ago. The Arctic Ocean may have been periodically ice-free. This is, this is real. People are finding this, and others are still going around in this world of the past. Now, I believe the world that all the ice will fall off of Greenland in 100 years is the world of the past. And uh, here's, uh, considering these different lines of evidence, a picture begins to evolve suggesting that the Arctic sea ice cover was strongly reduced during most, most of the early Holocene. That's the three millennia after the uh, 10,800 years ago ice age break. There appears to even have been periods of ice-free summers in large parts of the central Arctic Ocean. Fine. Now, let's run, the, let's run an experiment. Hansen is telling us this that if you have two degrees of warming over 100 years, that you can lose all the ice from Greenland, okay? In degree years, that's two times 100, or 200 degree years. I'm saying that the evidence shows here that the Arctic was probably about two degrees C warmer for, let's say, three millennia. We can even make it just one and a half degrees C, make it a really small number for three millennia. That's 1.5 times 3,000 degree years, or times 3,000 years, or 4,500 degree years. If all the ice didn't fall off of Greenland in 4,500 degrees, degree years of forcing, how is it going to fall off with 100? This is just, these are just basic numbers that are being ignored in this discussion. And then this was from this morning. Uh, this was the congressional testimony of June 23rd. 1988 when, as I said earlier, this lit the bonfire, the greenhouse vanities, and there were uh, computer models presented at this, uh, and this, these, this is scenario A, which is business as usual, which is what I maintain happened. Uh, there was no major emissions reductions uh, worldwide, or none. Uh, scenario B implied major reductions, they didn't occur, and the observed value is there on the bottom, that's the NASA, NASA GIST temperature record itself. I still don't understand um, why it is considered such an irreverence to show this particular image. Now, the lukewarmers have a different image, different vision than the hotheads. The lukewarmer image is modest anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions impact on climate. There are both positive and negative impacts on the Earth's environment and human society, and that the current, current climate reflects a combination of natural and anthropogenic influences. Uh, this is a guy was used to have brown hair when he colored it. Uh, and uh, in, 19, in 2002, he put a paper in Climate Research. This is one of the two papers that um, the East Anglia gang uh, wanted withdrawn from the literature. This is, this is not the same as the McIntyre and Michaels paper, or McKittrick and Michaels paper. This is um, a one on different ways of looking at global warming, and they went after the editors. Uh, and griped and groused to each other why this paper was published and how horrible it was. Uh, and we say, uh, looking at different, different um, analyses of surface temperature data and models, the constancy of these somewhat independent results 
encourages us that 21st century Warren will be modest and near the low end of the IPCC tar projections. I think that is pretty much the lukewarmer point of view. And it comes from things like taking apart the temperature histories and looking for non-climatic effects, uh, non-climatic warmings. Uh, Ross McKittrick and I did this, non-climatic effects in the CRU history. Uh, actually, we were looking at the NASA history. I'm sorry, that's a misprint. Uh, and uh, we looked at economic, social, and land use effects. Um, and what we found, these are the relative influences of non-climatic um, uh, factors on temperature. They're all, the T statistics are all in the positive. Um, one, we found, of course, high, high correspondence with every grid cell um, that we measured with satellite data. But then there were other measures that were, uh, all these are statistically significant influence on the surface temperature trends uh, in the grid cells. It was GDP, density, literacy, population growth, income growth, GDP growth, and coal consumption. These are all largely measures of economic status, uh, and they indicate that there are clear non-climatic effects in the temperature record. Uh, this is the difference between the observed and adjusted temperatures when we, when we factored those out. And the amazing thing about all that is this, which is this is the distribution of observed warming trends in the IPCC's temperature history. This, is, this one is the CRU temperature history. Uh, this is in the satellite temperature history. The tails are chopped off. When you, look, when you look at the satellite data. And this is what happens when we adjust it out for our economics. So we turned the surface temperature frequency distribution of warming from, this, from the land records into the satellite, implying, of course, the validification of the satellite data. Now here's something I think you need to be aware of, okay? Uh, there is a hard deck beneath which you cannot drop the surface temperature warming. And that is, uh, here are the global temperature trends, 79 to 2010, with a concurrency of the MSU. Uh, GIST, that's NASA, Hadley, and NSU. But the MSU is measuring in the troposphere, mid-troposphere, so you have the models predict about 20% more warming uh, in the lower troposphere than at the surface, and so you have to adjust that. And that gives you about one degree Celsius per 100 years uh, in the past as the deck beneath which you cannot go below there. I think that you cannot get less warming than that. Uh, and if we assume linearization of warming, that would give you obviously a warming clearly beneath the, the um, range of the IPCC. Warming rate is so low, well, again, the, the IPCC tends to predict linear warmings. Each one of these pieces of colored spaghetti is a, as an IPCC mid-range model. You can see that they sum up the wisdom of models to a linear warming, and you have a linear warming. It just happens to be really low. A couple reasons for it. Um, one, the ocean surface temperature is just being drastically misspecified in the computer models. In every basin except the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the observed uh, warming in the North Atlantic is, is slightly above what was being projected, but that's one of many ocean basins. Almost all of the ocean basins, the observed warming is less than half or about half of what is being projected by the IPCC models. That's 77 percent or 70 percent of the surface of the earth. That's a good reason to show you that something's wrong. I think that, that the ocean is disappearing, warming is being disappeared more into the deep, deep ocean uh, and that probably explains a lot. Uh, and then IPCC projects ranges of carbon dioxide concentration uh, and this is the projected range, and the red is the observed value, and you can see that you're right on the bottom of their range. So it wouldn't surprise me that the warming would be on the bottom of their range. And finally, methane, uh, sources of bovine flatulence, rice paddy agriculture, coal mining, and leaky pipes. Uh, here are the projections for methane, which is the second most important greenhouse gas that we're putting in the atmosphere. This is the IPCC's projected range. This is the consensus of scientists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if, um, if you don't understand the public choice pressures on science now, just don't before, just look at this picture. The observed changes in methane are completely outside of the IPCC's projected range, and their response for this in the AR4 was to continue to project increases in methane that are simply not occurring. So I call that a climate coup. Thank you very much.